We did a head-to-head -head comparison with the USP membrane filtration test and found that in, for nine out of the ten challenge organisms that we looked at, the average detection time was um, significantly fa faster using the BACT alert. So um, we, for better or for worse, um, also had the opportunity with some true contamination data to um, to do some head-to-head -head comparisons of the BACT alert to the uh, membrane filtration test. We had committed that if we ever got a positive with the BACT alert, we would also run it by the membrane filtration test um, to, confirm, uh, to confirm the detection. And as you can see, um, in all four of these cases, uh, the membrane filtration test took either 48 or 72 hours, and the, uh, the BACT alert was um, less than, well, I guess it was 32 hours in one case, but um, in general, approximately a day. So why is that important or why is that a big deal? Um, again, because so we have a product with a 72-hour shelf life and we often we have to ship the product before the final sterility test is all the way complete. So so what this allowed us to do is that if we had if we had waited for the compendial sterility test, it's likely that these contaminated products would have been implanted. But in this case, um, we were actually able to recall the products from the uh, distribution chain before implantation into the patient. So that's sort of the strength of the BACT test for us. Um, I did want to, uh, there were a couple of other ancillary benefits. Um, the BACT did allow us to reduce our false positive rate. Um, that was uh, basically because there was less handling during, less manipulation of the samples during the sterility test because you just have to inject it into a bottle as opposed to all the membrane filtration manipulations. We also were able to reduce cost per test, although this, again, patient safety was more of a driver than reducing cost. This was just sort of an ancillary benefit. Um, this slide is mainly just to show that you also do get a, I didn't give you the exact numbers, but you do get an economy of scale. So the more samples you run, the uh, cheaper the back alert becomes. And that's for a couple of reasons. It's basically um, the disposables are cheaper and you don't need as much labor. So to sum up for sterility, um, the advantages are there's definitely improved time to, to time to detection. It's a growth-based test that's similar to the compendial method, so it's something that the regulators are going to be familiar with. Um, the fact that it's a growth-based test means that it's non-destructive, so you can ID by typical um, identification methods. Um, it has a low false positive rate, partly due to the automation, and it also has reduced cost. Limitations, um, even though it, uh, it gives us faster detection, there's still a seven-day incubation period, so the test is still running while the product has been released and actually implanted. We do get to see the organisms faster so that we can recall the products if necessary, but it would be ideal to have a sterility test that was completed the same day. So for support, I just have our regulatory approvals here. So it's approved in the U.S. for Cardicel, and it's approved in Europe and Australia for Macy. And I'd say the only obstacle to getting something like this approved is that there was an extensive validation package that was required to show that this was comparable to the compendial sterility test. So moving on to endotoxin. Um, we also have a rapid method for endotoxin testing. And it's basically a handheld unit that you put a that you put a little cartridge into. Let's see if I can do this here. So that little cartridge just slides into the unit. You dilute your sample and you put 25 microliters of in each well. You push a button and you're done. So the good thing about this test is that it is just dirt simple and there's no microbiology training, which is good because I'm a chemist. So uh, so it was even easy for me to run and. Uh, Let's see what we got next here. So for the validation, um, this basically, because it's an instrument, it basically just needed your typical IQ, OQ, PQ type of validation. And um, oops, I'm sorry. Thanks. And this, um, this slide basically just describes how we did that validation. If, if there are questions later, you can certainly uh, contact me, I'm keeping an eye on the time. So for implementation, um, I think the best thing about this test is even though it's 
automated and handheld and it's in a little cartridge and it looks completely different from any other endotoxin test that you might that you might do this basically is exactly the same or it is the kinetic chromogenic method that's in the USP 83 and the uh, and the European pharmacopeia so and we've gotten confirmation from regulatory agencies that that yes this is the kinetic chromogenic method there's no no additional testing required to show that they're comparable you just do what you would do for the for the kinetic method and so basically there's a sample qualification requirement to show that it doesn't interfere with your test well, they're both working so again the the advantage is the big one as I said is that it meets the uh, kinetic chromogenic requirement so you can just implement this test I mean as a, as an endotoxin test after you've qualified your sample configurations um, for us we, we were doing a lot of gel clot testing um, as a semi um, semi-quantitative or qualitative test, uh, semi-quantitative I guess is a limit test. And this is nice because it actually gives you quantitative results. So if you get an endotoxin value, you get, um, you get a number associated with it as opposed to, well, it's greater than 0.5 or less than 0.5. The total test time is less than 30 minutes, so it's not a significant time savings over the other endotoxin tests, but it certainly is a, sim a, a time savings. And it has a very simple workflow, so it's easy for just about anybody to do. And, um, and not contaminate. It is slightly more expensive, and um, because of the handheld nature, you're basically running one sample as, at a time, where if you're loading a, a, a plate and putting it on a plate reader, you could probably run you know, quite a few samples at a time on a 96-volt plate. This has been approved by the, um, by the EMA for uh, Macy and Europe, and it will be submitted to FDA this year for Macy as well. And I didn't really, couldn't come up with any obstacles to implementation, again, because this is the compendial method, just a, a rapid way to do it. So moving on to mycoplasma, we um, several years ago had uh, undertaken a, a project to try and find a rapid test to use for mycoplasma. And uh, is Pinky in the room? I'm just going to ask her. If, can, I, can I go over by just a couple of minutes? OK, I'll try, I'll try and go through these quickly. I see that I'm coming up on my 15 quick. And uh, so we, we looked at 20 tests that were on the market, and we ranked them for critical attributes. So after that ranking, we came up with three tests. And the important things to look at for these tests were specificity and sensitivity primarily. Specificity, we wanted to make sure it could detect you know, the broad range of organisms that were out there. And sensitivity, we wanted to make sure it would get down to the um, sensitivity in the, actually the, pharma, the European pharmacopoeia was the guidance at the time for how to validate a, uh, a nucleic acid-based rapid mycoplasma test. So again, we looked at uh, false positives, false, false negatives, and cross-reactivity for selectivity, and did serial dilutions of the control. And to make a long story short, there were issues with kit one and kit two, and we picked kit, or I'm sorry, kit two and kit three, and we picked kit one, which was based on um, real-time PCR technology, to move forward into validation. So this is just a. Uh, this is just a, a snapshot, actually it's a little bit of detail, maybe it's more than a snapshot, of the, um, of the validation protocol. Again, we looked at specificity, um, ran a large number of organisms. We ran, actually we ran six organisms and six different strains of chondrocytes. Limited detection, we diluted both organisms down to below 10 CFU per mil and, uh, and equivalent amounts of DNA down to um, below equivalent to 10 CFU per mil. Precision, ruggedness, and equivalence were other things that we also looked at. I wanted to point out um, this, this method was also um, appropriate for automation. We, we validated the, the manual method here. Um, this probably takes two and a half to three hours to do. Um, it's got, you know, it's, it's got some um, lysis steps and some uh, purification steps that take a while. There's a centrifuge, there's a, uh, yeah, there's a centrifugation step that takes a half an hour. Um, we basically took that two and a half hours and were able to automate the whole thing. It, get, it can be done in about two hours, so it doesn't save you a huge amount of overall time, but it can be done without anybody present. So where, you know, the analyst has to be there 
for the whole, uh, the whole manual sample preparation. They just load the sample into these sample tubes here, and there are reagent, uh, reagent packs that have all of these reagents in them, and then a robot does all the work for you. So this is what we have submitted to EMA and have, um, have gotten approval for. This has been recently validated and will be uh, submitted as a variation and also submitted to FDA with, um, with our, uh, our package. So again, the advantages for the mycoplasma test, um, whoops, oh geez, I do that at least once. Um, the total test time is less than a day from start to finish, including the real-time PCR part. It's about five or six hours, so you know, maybe three hours of sample prep and a couple hours on the instrument. Um, the specificity and limit of detection, uh, basically, if you can get the organism in there, you detect it. So um, you can get down to as low as the growth-based methods, which uh, you know, are theoretically a you know, single, single organism detection. It's able to be automated. Um, it costs less than the, uh, than the growth-based method. Um, one limitation is that um, because, it's a, because you have to um, extract the nucleic acids from the organisms, they're no longer viable after that point. And so if, if you needed to ID the organism, you could only do it by a nucleic acid method for identification. So you don't have you know, viable cultures that you can send out for identification anymore. Um, we do have EMA, EMA approval for this test in Europe. And the obstacles, again, were, um, were an extensive validation package required. Um, the detection's a little bit different from, well, obviously the detection's a lot different from the, uh, from the culture method because you're detecting nucleic acids instead of actual organisms. So trying to explain that sometimes to the reviewers and analysts can be, can be a bit of a challenge. So there's definitely a, a learning curve that needs to be overcome. And um, also, in order to do the validation, because we're a cell culture manufacturing facility, we could not have viable organisms in the facility, so that meant um, we had to do the validation at a third site, which was logistically challenging, to say the least. All right. So um, to conclude, um, I think if we are, uh, we are persistent and if we break the problem down into small little chunks, and if we, uh, if we focus on one area at a time, that we, uh, like Uma, can also get our piggies wiggling.